Pick yourself from a scale from one to ten. And I was like really quiet, like shy, you know, like I was like, well, I was like in Ohio or just on the grand scale, you know, like California hot or Ohio hot, or you know, like I, I actually put a lot of time, to, a lot of thought into this before. And she, I was like, well, like just in general, you know, and I was like, well, on a good day, probably you know, like a, like a nine. <laughs> 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 she, she started. Uh, she started laughing her ass off because she thought. Remember, she's like, "Whoa!" Like she didn't expect that overconfidence in someone that was just right. so like. She was looking for some humility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from one to ten. Oh, I'm eleven and a half. <laughs> <laughs> like, good day. Oh, bad day. Right. Yeah. If I'm having a good hair day, I'd say twelve. Easy. If I'm having a bad hair day, nine point nine. Yeah, and I was and I was at the little points too. I was like nine point two. <laughs> oh my god! So that's exactly what I said. Nine point two or something. I missed the first part of this. What the heck? Is that a, a girl asking him to rate himself? Uh, my ex girlfriend. We used to the, the place we met was at my work, and I was like really really quiet. Like I paid no attention to anybody. Like, and then she just asked me. She was like, "What do you rate yourself?" And, you know, I was just like, "Well." And I, th and I put so much thought into this too before, you know, and I was like, uh, well, it depends, you know, like, Cal like if I was in California, I'd probably be like a seven, you know, <laughs> if I was, you know, on vacation, probably like an eight, and then, you know, and then I was like, well, here in Ohio, probably like a 9.2, <laughs> and, and then she started, uh, she just started laughing her ass off because she just didn't expect it. Oh my god. So you're getting a Jurassic Park collection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you rate her? What'd you give her? What did I give her mm -hmm. when I first met her? Mm -hmm. Probably like a eight or something like that. I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't really attracted. Like, I thought she was really young and dumb and mm. I was all mature and I was mm. like. You know, but yes. she ended up outgrowing me pretty fast. Yeah, they do that. And, uh, <laughs> but I thought she was really cute. And, uh, it, it was just, uh, <clears throat> she rated herself like a seven or something. Because she's like, like, well, what do you rate yourself? And she said, she's like, a seven. And she's like, she's like, people, normal people don't do that, you know, they... Right, they, they, exactly. they rate themselves something average, you know, but you just straight up just 9.2, <laughs> like, who does that? <laughs> Oh my God! Oh my God. Well, I really thought about this. So, well, what do you base that on? <laughs> well, I base it on just comparisons I've made with magazine pictures and people I see in the movies and my favorite TV show and the anchors on on the TV news and uh, whether I'm having a good hair day or a bad hair day. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we're just having a fun time in recovery at Justin's Lighthouse. <clears throat> Uh, this is part of our uh, Justin's Lighthouse video series, and today we're going to talk about immaturity and addiction, and they are they do go together. You know, everyone who's had any kind of experience with addiction or recovery understands this basic premise that however old you were when you began using, you stopped developing emotionally, and that's why we tend to be or act like twelve-year-olds. 10 year olds. We can be a 38, 30 year old man and still throw temper tantrums like a child, still have extreme impulsivity. Well, we're going to break that down today and we're going to really take a look at that because that is a critical part of recovery. That's a critical part of growing in recovery and maturing. Recovery, you know, is about 20% not using and drinking today. And it's about 80% just growing up. And of course, part of that growing up is <clears throat> learning how to accept our personal responsibilities and developing the emotional maturity where we are willing to follow through with those personal responsibilities whether we feel like it or not. And so we have these cute little sayings that help us along the way and that's where do the next right thing comes from. It doesn't say do the next right thing if you feel like it. Do the next right thing if it's convenient. Do the next right thing if everybody else is doing it. Just do the next right thing. And that will help us grow because especially in the beginning, you're not going to feel like doing the next right thing. I don't want to make my bed in the morning. I got to go uh, I got to go jump in the shower, man. I got to check out the news. I got to da 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 whatever. 
that's not how we get better. <clears throat> but we're going to break that down today and help you guys really understand where that comes from. Because that's where our trauma lies. That's where our growth has to take place. <clears throat> In a lot of ways, <clears throat> you know, think of it this way. Growing up, for whatever reason, you did not experience childhood in a way that has facilitated our growth. Now, I'm not saying that's anybody else's fault. I'm saying this is the reality of our situation um, for whatever reason. And, and what I mean by that is, is you know, as we, as we go through very specific stages in our life, certainly adolescence and early adolescence, there are very uh, specific developmental skills that need to take place. Uh, discipline, we need to be developing discipline, we need to feel safe, we need to feel secure, uh, we need to feel confident. That's how we build confidence, is having consistency in our life. Cons things that you can count on, things that you know are going to happen no matter what. You get home from school, there's a snack waiting for you, you watch your favorite TV show at 4, you do your studying at 5.30, you know, parent comes home at six. You have dinner. Da da da. Consistency. Well, and the in in the bulk of addicts growing up, that was not present. In fact, just the opposite. And you're going to find how that's harmed us. That has that has preempted our growth process. So so much of early recovery is literally developing those skills that we didn't learn when we were eight. We didn't learn when they were 12. We didn't, I should say, we didn't develop them. Okay, so let me, let me go through this for a second. And it's okay, people watching on video, it's okay, I know you can't see the words on the board, but I'm gonna go through them line by line. So if you wanna take notes, take notes, but you're gonna have to listen to me because I know you can't see or unless you wanna pause it and blow it up or something like that, but. Okay, let's talk about just some traits. Okay, you know, addiction and immaturity. Addicts suffer from inflexible emotions. Now you got to really think about that for a second. You know, it's real easy. You know, we see that word immaturity, and man, we don't want any part of that. You know, we think, oh man, I'm a grown man. That doesn't apply to me. Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. Inflexible emotions. All that means is, is you know, we talk about this when we talk about trauma. We've developed survival skills. We haven't developed um, healthy coping developmental skills we've developed survival skills to protect us emotionally so we have we have pretty inflexible emotions that means we've got one way to react to react to what not getting something that we want losing something we thought we had or getting caught for something we did or said we have one way to react basically in a nutshell we have one way to react when life isn't going our way. And it's usually very quick. <clears throat> we are often wrought with anger, resentment, and hatred. Now those are pretty harsh words. And I know in my early recovery process, you know, learning learning about that about myself, oh no, no, that didn't have anything to do with me. You don't understand. I'm the nice guy. I'm the I'm the guy who will come and help you you know, at the side of the road at 2 o'clock in the morning, I don't ever get angry, blah, blah, blah. No, you may not show this to anybody else. You just disappear and implode. You know, we just self-destruct. Some of us are more passive. Some of us are more aggressive. But it's still there. It's anger, resentment, and hatred. Now, think about that for a minute. Think about how quick we can get in our, how, how far uh, along we can jump in our anger. You know, we were talking about this not long ago, I think last week a little bit, about how our reaction to things is not proportional to what's actually being experienced. Well, why is that? Well, that's part of our immaturity. And the other part of that is because it's, it's, it's triggered an old, old pain. Well, that's part of the growing up. We've got we've to be willing to heal those and recognize those and respond in mature ways whether you feel like it or not. <clears throat> so in childhood we suffer a loss of love, joy, and intimacy. 
you know, I want you guys to share a little bit here in a second. We suffer a loss of love, joy, and intimacy. And intimacy is not sex. Intimacy is a closeness. Uh, a closeness that you can count on with another person. It can be men, women, it doesn't matter. Intimacy. You can have intimacy with the clerk at the convenience store. You're, you're allowing yourself to be vulnerable with them. They're giving you some vulnerability. You're connecting on an emotional level. That's all intimacy is. We haven't experienced hope or love for a long time. Now, wow, you know, really let that just kind of sink in for a minute. Oh no, that's not true. Uh, I experienced love. Why, just last week, I, you know, just a month ago before I got into rehab, I, uh, you know, I, I had a girlfriend. No, we've had people in our lives that have poured out love onto us, but we don't know how to experience that. We don't know what love is. We associate love with getting stuff. We associate love with never hearing the word no. We don't know what love is. So, incidentally, we haven't experienced hope or love for a long time, maybe ever. You know, when you really start going through this process and you get honest with yourself, and you really look at, you know, your life up to this point in your life, many of us come to the conclusion that I've never really had love or hope. Wow, that's, you know, that makes me sad. But, we got to look at it. We got to look at it. We um, <clears throat> we've been left, or we are left, in a serious emotional vacuum. You know that gets back to just one way of responding. These inflexible emotions. It's a vacuum. That's why the perfectionism that we operate in so much. You know, we need things to be a certain way or else because we live in an emotional vacuum. We don't know how to respond when things are a little iffy, when things are a little inconsistent, when something is a little unpredictable. That's because most of us have grown up in an environment where it was extremely unpredictable. Especially if you grew up in an addict or an alcoholic home, if you grew up in a high control home or a home where mental, mental illness was present, um, you experienced a lot of unpredictability, you know, anger and violence, all of that. You don't know what's going to happen next. So, as a survival skill, it, it's it's um, it stunted our emotional maturity, but it became a, hand, a nifty little convenient survival skill, and that is, I just need everything to be a certain way. So now in recovery, you know, we, we've got to learn how to connect with the world in a completely different way. And that scares the crap out of us <clears throat> because we lack emotional maturity. We have a, we have a propensity to self-alienation and dependency, which just means we would rather isolate. Why? Because there we, we're not risking anything. There it feels safe. But you know you got to step one that stuff now. This is where we got to recognize that that really hasn't helped me. That has led to uh, being out of touch. That has led you know go back to this one: hope and love. It keeps me from loving. It keeps me from hoping. It keeps me stuck in my own little head. But we think we're protecting ourselves by alienating ourselves. But just the opposite ends up happening and it causes us dependency. And then we have a universal fear and mental insecurity. A universal fear. That means we're afraid of everything. And we're specifically afraid of not getting something we want, losing something we thought we had. And that is too great a risk, right? For the addict brain, that is too great of a risk it's re-traumatizing, so we would rather just keep everything in a nice, neat little box. And the problem is, is in early recovery, we try to work recovery in the exact same way. We just want to put it in a nice, neat little box. I've got my book, and I read this. I read, I read uh, two pages a day, and I, I, I like seven of the twelve steps, and I like this particular 
uh, presenter, but I don't like this presenter, and I only want to watch these TV shows, and I only want to go to these certain places, and we try to rebuild our life in recovery the exact same way we built a dysfunctional life in our addiction. That's why it won't work. We've got to break past all of this stuff. <clears throat> now, here are these primary characteristics. You know, uh, a 30-year-old addict uh, may act like a 10-year-old child in terms of functioning. What does that mean exactly? You know, we'll just look at in your in your own situation, in your own life. You know, in my case, you guys know, I was 38 when I first got sober, when I first got into recovery. And yet, I had a propensity for throwing little temper tantrums when I didn't get my way, getting extremely anxious at the word no. And, and all I mean by that is, you know, you don't actually have to hear the word no. It's just something's not working out the way you want it to work out. So to you, that is, oh, it's, you know, I'm not going to get what I want. I'm not going to get what I thought I had. Uh, we do it in our relationships. I mean, we can, we can flip out because our parent won't buy us, you know, a pack of tobacco. We can flip out because they won't give us five dollars. We can absolutely lose our marbles, for lack of a stronger word. Think about that. That's not how adults respond to life. And yet, that's how we respond to life in our sickness. And just because we're sober today doesn't mean all of a sudden we're mature today. We have, to, we have to build on that. We have to develop maturity. Um, <clears throat> we typically are forced into adulthood before experiencing childhood. Okay, now that's kind of what I was talking about in the very beginning. Think about that for a minute. Okay, I'll share from you know my my experience. Uh, my parents got divorced pretty early. I was five, I think. Older brother, younger brother, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, dad's no longer in the house, and mom's working all the time, and all of a sudden, you know, I didn't become the man of the house. My older brother took on that responsibility, so he just missed his childhood. Right now, he's got to he's got to take on responsibilities that a uh, you know, seven-year-old child shouldn't be taking on, and then the rest of us, we don't we don't take on responsibilities. We now lose, give up responsibility. So you could be on either end of that, but it's the exact same result. It's you're no longer experiencing childhood. You're now experiencing adulthood from a childhood perspective, from a child perspective. Think about that. You know, as you really dig into this stuff and really get honest about it and look at it, of course we became addicts and alcoholics. This is a messed up way of living. It's nobody's fault. You know, my parents got divorced. Well, a lot of people's parents get divorced. What's our divorce rate now? Uh, you know, it's like 50%. A lot of people have experienced divorce and they didn't become addicts. Okay, well, we can have that argument another day. We're talking about addicts and immaturity today, not non-addicts and immaturity. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read just a little bit from this research thing that I've been studying. But And it's actually higher in opiate addicts, by the way. Opiate addicts tend to be more immature than non-addicts or addicts of other substances. They're still working on that one. They don't know why, they just know that's what they found in their, in their research. Okay, the society and family have not given an opportunity to experience childhood. Okay, well that kind of sounds like we're trying to blame something. I mean, let me rephrase that. As a matter of course, we experience life and, and part of that experience was we missed out on some childhood development. Let's go with that. The fact remains, it's not society's fault, it's not family's fault. It's just what happened in our lives. Okay, so now we've got to deal with it. We've tried to deal with it by just covering it up, acting like it's no big deal. I got it all together. Uh, we exhibit perfectionism and isolation and self-alienation and all this other stuff that we develop or that we rely on to feel okay. 
And that's what keeps us stuck in our immaturity. We, uh, let me tie all this together. To grow emotionally, one needs to experience failure. Okay, so in your experience, you may have instantaneously at the age of nine now become the man of the house, but you also may have not had that experience. You may have just been showered with, you know, feel good experiences, both end in the same result. We don't get to experience failure, so we never grow emotionally. We don't have real childhood experiences. It's normal to go try out, you know, for the soccer team and not get picked. It's normal to, you know, try to play kickball at recess and not get chosen. Or you get chosen and then you make, you know, you screw up, you, you miss the, the, the game winning goal and all your classmates, you know, uh, embarrass you. Those are normal experiences that as, as, a, as an, a, an adolescent with an opportunity for failure can overcome. You process it, you talk about it, you feel bad about it, you seek some guidance about it, you get some good advice about it, and you move on. It helps you grow um, emotionally. But typically that's not the case in the history of addicts. In the history of addicts, either no one's there and we're left to our own devices, or someone is there, come rushing to our aid, and instantly try to address our emotions so that we don't feel bad. So we never get to go through that process of feeling bad, feeling hurt, feeling embarrassed. There's always somebody there to make it all better. Okay, so that's how we get stunted in our emotional growth. It's interesting, isn't it? And you know, think back in your own experiences. You know, you'll remember specific events in your life. I've even heard, you know, a, lo a lot of you guys share, you know, I just, I remember not feeling the same as my friends. I would watch my friends go through experiences, but then if I had some similar experience, it seemed like uh, I experienced something completely different. You know, my uh, being, you know, you, you screw up and uh, you, there's some discipline involved. Well, when I screw up, I, you know, my mom probably felt so guilty for getting a divorce while her kids were still young. You know, she did everything in her power to make sure we never hurt again. So when we would screw up, you know, we would just deny that there was some sort of screw up. And you go, oh, it's okay. You know, let's we'll get you some new shoes. Let's go shopping. Let's re redecorate your bedroom. You know, it's all about. It's all about overcompensating so we don't have to feel bad. Well, I mean, that's a nice gesture, but it, it's prevented us from growing emotionally. That's why now as adults, you know, what we bring to early recovery this high need for instant gratification, the impulsivities, the never, never feeling comfortable with what is, always wanting something more, something around the corner, it needs to be bigger, it needs to be different. You know, shoot, we can walk into a room and look around and want to change it. Oh, well, let's put that chair over there. And let's, let's move that bookshelf on this side. And oh man, this, this room would totally look better. You know, let's take the vending machines and we'll stick them on that wall. And well, that's, that's what we're talking about. That's that childlike perspective. Never, because we never develop the ability to just be okay with what is. In fact, we're never okay with what is. That's where we're constantly moving. We're constantly in forward motion. And, you know, it's absolutely critical in early recovery to just let things play out. Now, we can kind of fake that for a while. We can do it for, you know, 30 days, 60 days, maybe 90 days. But eventually, we get to our mind tells us, okay, I've done, I've done this, whatever this is, I've done this long enough, now I'm ready for that. And that's where we usually shoot ourselves in the foot. That's what, what, what was needed at that moment is to keep doing it. Keep doing it, keep doing it, solidify it. 
uh, people who fail in recovery are people who never solidified their recovery. They they worked sort of to get to a certain point emotional of, of emotional maturity and then they instantly wanted more and then changed this and changed that and I need a little bit more. They never allowed themselves to get to a point and then learn how to maintain that point. Just keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over. And, and the way addicts would argue that is, so I'm just supposed to do this the rest of my life? That's all or nothing thinking. You know, think about that. Because we, we think that. That's how addicts think. You know, I recently had a conversation where I heard exactly that. And I was trying to encourage someone, you know, you don't need to do anything different right now. Oh, well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Great. Just keep doing those things, nothing more. Don't quit adding to it. Or subtracting. We want to add or subtract. Don't do anything. Don't change anything. And that was his response. So I'm just supposed to do this the rest of my life? Wow, where did that come from? See, that gets back into this fear. We're so afraid that we're not going to get something that we want, that we're going to lose something we thought we had. So the minute we get to a little bit of comfort zone, we want to add to it, we want to subtract from it, we want to change it, we want to run past it. And those are the people who never really grow in recovery. They're the other ones who ultimately will relapse, and um, you know, and some of, about fifty percent of us don't make it in after a relapse. So you're gonna, and I, and I stress that because you're going to have those moments where you're going to be thinking, you know what, I I got this, I got this, I'm good. What I need to do now is I need, I just need to. You know, get a job, get a girl, get a car, get my own apartment, you know, and then, because I'm good, right? I'm in a good place. That is the absolute worst thing you could ever do, and here's why. Because it would be your idea. We've got to do, if we're really going to grow in, in our emotional maturity, what we got to do is stop making decisions. There will come a time in your life where you'll, you will have developed the ability to make healthy decisions. But in early recovery, when I say early recovery, I'm talking about the first two years. In early recovery, what we're trying to develop now, or re-experience now, is the ability to listen to others and follow instructions. And then everything will work out. But we want to fight that. We want to challenge that because we've been making decisions on our own for such a long time. I want this and so I'll chase that. And If it goes bad it's no big deal because someone else will fix the problem and then I'm going to move on to the next thing and I want this so I chase that and I want this and I chase that and as long as I can get everything but you know think about that that's been the the chaos you never actually achieved it. Oh, We've, we've had lots of stuff we can acquire, we're, we're great, we're masters at acquiring things. We can acquire stuff, we get it, and then we don't even enjoy it. Now i got to have this, and now I need this, and now I want the black one, and now I want the red one, and I want the black stripe on it, and I want the... That's what I'm talking about. We'll do the exact same thing in early recovery. Don't do it. Don't fall for it. That's what keeps you stunted. We feel insecure towards the outside world. Okay, you know, we talk at length about that. That's kind of a self-explanatory. Um, our need to escape, or I'm sorry, our, our um, wait a minute, I wrote that wrong. Oh, yeah, we, in order for us to escape, we need support, which requires dependency. Okay, let me, let me break that down. I'll give you an example of that. In order for me to stay on the outside of the world, not be involved in society. That means, you know, I don't hold the job well. That means I don't get along well with other people that don't agree with me. So we, just as two examples, we are scared to death to live life. So in order for us to stay alienated, to protect ourselves emotionally, we have to be dependent on someone, right? Because I'm too afraid to go out and, 
you know, work a full-time job on a regular basis. So I'm always relying on my mom to take care of my rent, my mom to take care of my car payment or just flat out buy me one, my mom to take care of my cell phone bill, my mom to da-da-da-da-da. So the very thing that we despise, and that is our lack of independence, you know, we may even say things like, you know, I'm tired of y'all treating me like a child. Just quit treating me like a child. When are you going to treat me like a grown-up? I'm a grown man. When are you going to treat me like one? You know, we may even have those arguments with our families. And then as we leave, okay, hey, can I get 20 bucks? That's not independence. That is dependence. And we despise it. It's no wonder we are filled with so much anger, resentment, and hatred. That's real. You'll never break free from that until we truly become independent. And by the way, as you do that and you grow emotionally, it'll, it'll change the entire dynamic of your family relationships. Your families will no longer be your banker, but they'll actually be mom and dad and siblings and you know whatever and aunts and uncles and grandparents and because up to up to now we've we've looked at them as either our source of pain or our you know our our bondsmen so to speak our life bondsmen whenever i've got a crisis they'll come bond me out they'll bail me out that's you know then we can't figure out why we don't you know we always have conflict in those relationships it's because of our immaturity and there's only one way to move past it and that is is we gotta get real teachable and we gotta be willing to stay in the game the second you you are so uncomfortable with what is and you think the next thing that needs to be happen is you need to jump off of that into something else without any guidance any support any any seeking, you know, wisdom from another person, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're jumping off a cliff, is what's happening. Okay, let me let me finish going through this pretty quick because I do want to get the the, uh, the the solution in. Harmful experiences of childhood in regard to disillusionment with mothers. Okay, that's a that's a mouthful right there. What what this study uh, brought into play was especially when it came to men or males is they found that you know the majority of, of addicts male addicts have a disillusionment with their mothers and a mother's disregard for the child's emotional needs has disrupted the child's self-regulatory processes okay now I'll explain that here in a second but look at this look at this last part for a minute. Think about your self regulatory processes. We're not real big on telling ourselves no. We have a high need for instant gratification. We don't we don't know how to regulate our ourself. Right? We just want, want, want. I want to get this, I want to get that, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that. We we don't know how to self regulate. We only know what I'm feeling at any given moment and what I need to do about that to either in increase that feeling or to ch exchange it for a different feeling. We miss that. Usually a, you know, a child develops that in, in early adolescence, you know, between the ages of you know, 5 and 12, childhood. Well, think about what was going on in your life between the ages of 5 and 12. Missed it. Didn't, didn't happen. Uh, okay, let's talk about this. This seems pretty harsh. You know, uh, mothers, uh, a disillusionment with mothers. Okay, well, let's think about that for a minute, though. It's not a bad thing. We just need to understand it. What, what would be a normal perspective of uh, of a mother from a child. How how should a healthy five year old child um, view its mom? A nurturer, consistency, unconditional love, support, encouragement, discipline. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I'm not talking about yelling 
and screaming and grounding, I'm talking about discipline. I'm talking about affording the child consequences for their behavior. Well, that's a hard thing to do. Okay, we may have we may have gotten a lot of yelling and screaming, but then we get to go shopping and have ice cream. That's not consequences. That's just yelling and screaming. So this is what they're talking about in this disillusionment in regards to mom. What does that end up teaching us? I don't have consequences. I don't have consequences. In fact, just the opposite. Not only do I not have consequences, I'm supposed to get what I want when I want it. I'm supposed to be able to do stuff that I want to do. I'm not supposed to have any difficulties. I'm not supposed to do anything I don't want to do. We're talking about a five-year-old, seven-year-old, ten-year-old, twelve-year-old. Now look at our behavior and our outlook in, in early adulthood. It's the exact same thing because we missed the developmental stages that would teach us those things. Think about it. Wow, that's pretty dang powerful. It doesn't mean mom sucks. It really has nothing to do with mom. It has to do with our disillusionment in regard to mom. Wow. And typically, you know, parents... Parents either parent exactly the way they were parented, forgive me, or if it was a really bad experience, they will, will modify their behavior to make up for how badly they were parented and then tend to go overboard to the opposite extreme. So you're either, you know, if your parents were like overly disciplined and, and maybe even to the point of abuse and then there was a change then that person is probably going to parent in a way that there was no discipline. Wow, well, that's why we never developed that ability to self-regulate. You know, no, Miles, having ice cream right now is just not a good idea. And then we throw a temper tantrum, and Mom lets us throw a temper tantrum. I'm sorry, but you're still not going to get what I want, or what you want. But here's the kicker, and this is where the codependency comes in. Our parents will make decisions based on how they are feeling. It makes them feel bad to see us feel bad. So they will make a decision so that they don't have to feel bad, even if it harms us. Now they're not, you know, they're not taking all that into account. Parents don't necessarily understand what they're doing in that moment. But that's ultimately what happens. And that's what they mean here. The mother's disregard for the child's emotional needs. The emotional need of a child at the point of discipline is accountability. The, there, there is no emotional need. It's a behavioral requirement. But our, our moms, they see us hurting, crying, bawling, throwing a tantrum. They feel bad, so they say, okay, it's all right. Never mind. Calm down. You know, we'll go get some new dinosaurs today. Everything will be okay. You can have the credit card, whatever. It's the exact same behavior we've done as adults. See, we we ultimately end up manipulating that. So, it's not about mom, it's or dad, whatever, you know, whoever the enabler was in your in your life. It's about us and how we develop a sense to manipulate. I can manipulate that. All I got to do is play the poor pitiful me. My life sucks. It's never my fault. My boss was out to get me. My girlfriend did me wrong, etc., etc. And that enabler comes running in in all their denial and goes, Oh my goodness, my poor baby. You are such a victim of circumstance. You are such a victim of the world. You're victim, victim, victim. And then we become 38, 48, 58 year old grown men who still act like children. And we can't figure out why we have so much conflict in our lives. That's why. Because we never grew up. We never grew up. So what's happening in all of that is it's damaging our mental structure. 
for our internal behavior. We don't even recognize it. And that's why, you know, we talk about this in the relapse dynamic. At one point, we just lose complete control of our behavior. We don't know how to self-regulate. We will just go and go and go and go and go until we hit a brick wall. And that brick wall is just someone's finally telling us no. And what's our first reaction when you hear no? We throw a timber tantrum. This is bull crap. I'm not, I'm not talking about this right now. I'm da -da -da. It's the same thing when we were 10. Only now we're older, so you know we have we can have more aggressive body posture. We can raise our voice, you know, in a deeper way. We can become more aggressive, but it's the exact same temper tantrum we threw when we were seven. We lose all control of our own behavior. Don't underestimate addiction and immaturity. So the result of all of this is we become dependent on external things, drugs, girls, having fun, having stuff, materialism. Remember, you know, we, we've been talking about the comfort zone. I just need this and this and this and this and this and don't, don't, don't even let me catch you looking at my stuff. This is my stuff. We become very possessive of our stuff because to us, we think it means safety. In reality, it doesn't mean that at all. That's just how we've developed this dysfunctional coping skill. We're compensating for our emotional deficiencies. This is where that impulsivity comes from. I don't know if you can see that on the camera. But let, me, let me read it slower to think about it. You know, really apply it. Drugs, alcohol, girls, having fun, having stuff, getting stuff. We're constantly being impulsive, right? We need instant gratification. We're, we're, in this, we're in this ongoing forward motion to do what we want to do when we want to do it. And it's very important, you know, especially in an environment like this, is to practice this self-regulation. You, you, you gotta catch yourself when you're starting to get, you know, a little worked up because something's not going your way, this is the time to practice that. This is the time to recognize, man, that's my same old behavior. Oh yeah, don't let me skip past this. By the way, that's never enough. You'll never have, you'll never do enough drugs, have enough girlfriends, get enough stuff, do enough stuff. You know, you got to recognize that it wasn't satisfactory. It didn't really fill us. You know, think about all the stuff we've done in your life, the things that you've chased, the things that you've owned, the things that you've been a part of, and yet we still arrive at this point feeling empty and unsatisfied with life. It didn't work. It didn't work. If having the coolest car on the street was supposed to make me whole, it failed. Ego. Ego is part of immaturity. So we got to recognize this. You got to start delaying gratification because that's what begins to reverse the sickness. And here's a way you can practice this. You know, I love this little tip. Practice delaying gratification in little moments, little little bitty things. And all you're doing is is you're 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 wanting something, but you're willing to to exert enough maturity towards it to just hold it off for a minute. So you can practice those moments. The next time you the next time you feel like having a cigarette or having tobacco, whatever. Just wait five minutes. Just go, wait a second, because you'll find that that's so reactionary. Right? The minute we have a want, we be, we get reactionary. Wait five minutes, go do something that, that is considered a responsibility. Oh man, I'm going to go outside and have a cigarette for a minute. Catch yourself, hit the pause button, go do a chore, read uh, two paragraphs in the big book, um, pray, do some responsibility driven recovery thing, and then go have your cigarette. Or whatever. 
the next time you want something, just delay it just for a minute. Just so, you know, that's why people fast. It helps you to, to understand just how much control we really do have over our own behavior. We control it, but the addict thinks we can't control it. That I'm just, because remember, you got taught that in childhood. If I want something, I'm just supposed to have it. Well, you've got to start reversing that part of the sickness. You've got to reverse it. And that part lies with you. No one can make you do that. No one would want to make you do that. You've got to want to do that. You have to catch it. You have to hit the pause button and go, but first I'm going to go do this thing. And then go enjoy your cigarette. I guarantee you, you'll enjoy it a lot more. It's, and you know that's just one example. There's all kinds of little bitty things and ways you can practice that throughout your day. You have to start developing security with yourself and others. You know this is all you know this is all driven by our our lack of security. Well, you got to start developing security amongst yourself with yourself. You are secure. You are safe whether you got stuff or not. It's not the external stuff that gives you safety and security. It's the way you think about it. You are secure because you are connecting with the world in a new way. You are secure because you're, you're safe, you're fine, you have something to contribute. It doesn't matter whether people like you, people don't like you, you don't know how to interpret that anyway. And others through responsibilities. You know, it gets back to that next right thing. When we just when we're just living up to our responsibilities, security, your sense of security will follow. You will feel good about you. You will feel safe in your environment wherever you are because you're doing your responsibilities. That's a very empowering place to be when you realize just how much control you really have over your own well-being you will you will protect that you will guard that and you will be less likely to give it away and then the fourth one you gotta allow yourself to feel that this whole this whole life here is about not it's about suppressing what I'm really feeling and chasing impulses well now we've got to do that in reverse. Now we've got to allow yourself to feel what you are feeling. But don't follow those feelings. That's why we got to slow down. It's okay to feel hurt. It's okay to feel embarrassed. It's okay to feel guilty. It's okay to feel like you don't belong. It's okay to feel like you're not lovable. That's not necessarily reality. You can feel the feeling, chase the responsibility. Feel the feeling, chase the responsibility. You guys want to share anything? What bells and whistles are going off? The characteristics of being forced into adulthood, poor experience in childhood. And I know I definitely miss those important developmental ages yeah. in my life. <clears throat> that's, uh, that's kind of scary when you see it in writing. Yeah. And, you know, in, in, in some ways, there's probably a lot of good things that have come about that, come out of that. So you develop, you develop skills maybe that the average person doesn't have. You develop some abilities the average person doesn't have. And we're not talking about physical maturity. That hasn't really hurt us. It's that emotional immaturity. And so that's what's missing. So it's going to be so important to allow yourself to have those developmental experiences again. And you know, one of the things, one of the ways, 
you know, when you when you feel like you're forced into adulthood pretty early on, or you've missed this, the reality is 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 we've learned a lot of knowledge. We tend to have a lot of information about different things, and it's very easy to get stuck in the idea that I don't I already know everything. There's really nothing left for me to learn. So you can you can be in an experience with someone else whatever working on something that that seems so elementary it seems so beneath you and you're just not even going to be teachable we've got to start viewing every situation as a possible learning experience even if it's something that you think you're an expert in practice just listening practice you know because part of that is 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 remember because it's it's underlying with insecurity so if I have a lot of knowledge, and part of my sickness is, 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 is I need you to recognize that about me, then I'm not really going to be real, real teachable. You know, oh, you're trying to plug in a lamp, and it's a three-pronged thing, and you only got a two-pronged outlet, and, you know, oh, here, I, I can take care of that. What we need to do is we just need to pull out this little ground thing, or we need to go get a little adapter, and blah, 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 blah right? We just want to kind of exert control and take a situation over. Those are perfect opportunities to practice this development, to allow yourself to develop again. And maybe all that you need to do in that situation is just listen and let the other person experience their process. Let them figure out that it's not going to fit. Let them find an, their own solution because that's the very thing that that we missed. We weren't allowed to go through that process in you know in whatever way. Where you you get stuck on something, uh, you can't figure it out, right? We're used to people just rushing in, making it all better, and we didn't learn anything because they were so afraid of us being hurt. Well, I don't want them to be sad. I don't want them to go without. So I just got to make sure everything's okay. And we will then in turn, in adulthood, do the exact same thing. And it rob, we rob ourselves the opportunity to develop that. Simply by now, I got to fix everything. I got to be the go-to guy. Oh, look, they're having a problem out there. I'm going to run out there and I'm going to take it over. And Well, this is what you all need to do. You need to... You need to move this dirt pile and you just need to go over there and just cut it in half and, and only use mulch on this side and then you want to do a, dig a little hole right here. and Right? That's our survival skill. And here's the reality. We, we're pretty good at some of that stuff. Quit being an expert and just let yourself learn. And even if it means relearning a situation that you think you're an expert on. You know, you'll find all the, 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 the men in your life that you, you've looked up to, you know, since childhood, the guys that you really admire, maybe a, an uncle or a grandfather or a neighbor or a family friend or someone at church or whatever, they, you, one of the reasons you like them is because they're super smart. But then, when you're around them and there's there's a problem to be solved, they're not the first in line to solve it. Well, but but they could solve this right now. What? Because they they've learned what we're talking about now. They've learned that if someone wants their help, they'll ask for it. They don't need to jump to the front of the line and say, "Oh, here's how you need to handle that." And you just need to do this, and you just need to do that, because I'm an expert in all things, and I just need you guys to know about it. That's how normal, healthy people live. Normal, healthy people who developed in childhood the the opportunities to fail, and then ask for help, and then get help. That's where we become teachable. Addicts, we're just we're not real high on the list of teachability. So we need to get high on the list of teachability if we're gonna if we're really gonna make it. The hardest thing you'll do is have a conversation with someone about something that you think you're an expert in and just listen. Just listen. 
Oh no no that no that's not right man uh uh-uh, man the sixty seven Camaro was made with a three oh five four barrel and uh you know we just always got something to say and you're missing learning. Well now hopefully you understand how immaturity is really driving addiction. And we've got to be willing to emotionally grow up. And the way we do that is quit trying to prove to the world that we already know everything. Just let the world be the world. we got to focus on these things. Just delay your gratification. And by the way, that's part of gratification. That, that this internal need to just jump to the front of the line and explain everything and, oh no, here's how you need to do it. That, that would result in instant gratification for us, right? Delay it. Delay that. Just don't do it. Just let it play out. And if they, if they pull out of the parking lot and their back wheel falls off, that's their issue. Then you can run out there and you can help them. And, but see, we're, we'll, that's how we'll rationalize it. Oh, no, I had to get involved because I'm such an expert and they were doing it wrong and it could have it uh, put them in danger. That's bull crap. We do not have the power to go around and save everybody's life. But that's how we'll rationalize it. Right? Oh, no, no, I was just trying to help you. I was just trying to help them. That is bull crap. I was just trying to get me some instant gratification. That's the reality. Quit. Delay it. Delay it. Delay it. Delay it. Delay it. That, that's really good input. You, you want to share on that? You got something? Yeah, I'll say something. Um, I guess for me, uh, I mean, I'll just jump to the solution part. But uh, Jump on. Just uh, growing up, you know, basically living from instant gratification to instant gratification, just so feelings driven. Like, my day would literally run on just how I would feel. Like, you know, if I felt like smoking, felt like eating, felt like doing this, felt like doing that, you know, and just having like 30 different ideas in my head of what I wanted to do. Yeah. And that's basically been my life like the past 25 years, you know, and right now that's what I'm trying to do is uh, learning to recognize when I have those type of thoughts and you know if, if I have like all these like well I feel like doing that I feel like you know I gotta like that's why that's kind of at least an example that's kind of how I quit smoking was what, what the process you just described and it was mm. like when I would feel like I wanted to smoke like I would recognize the feeling I got really big urge and then I would put it off for I don't know five minutes or something I'd go do something I'd go uh, you know I'd look at my schedule and see what was my responsibility at the time I'd go do that and then you know after a week you know that turned into 10 minutes and it's like <laughs> in an hour you know so I would delay it for an hour and eventually you know after about three months it was almost like I was smoking one cigarette throughout the whole day Wow. And then it became nothing. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like, just... Wow. It's kind of like, you know, uh, it's kind of like learning how to control, or, you know, controlling that. Or, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I have to go through that like every single day. I have to, because, because I, you know, I'm still feelings driven. You know, like nothing's really changed about how the way I feel, you know, felt a year ago till now. Yeah. You, know, you still have the same kind of needs and stuff, but yeah. I guess the important thing is uh, is really recognizing and really understanding it and doing something different. Yeah. Because you know you can't stay in that immaturity and that whatever, you know, that's a part of growing up. You know, you just finally realize, like, the gig is up. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. You can't always have what you want. You know, you can't always base everything off your feelings. You know, and you have to do something different. You have, you have responsibilities now. You can't just dick off all day. You know? <laughs> and someone else take care of your bills. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, so that's what I'm kind of going through right now. You know? Just delaying that gratification because eventually you realize that eventually, you know, you might do, you might get those things. You know, you might get them better. You might not get them, but still, you know, shouldn't really affect you emotionally. But most of the time, you're you're content with what you have. 
Yeah. You know, nothing's gonna go wrong. The world, you know, you're not gonna. The world's not gonna end tomorrow if you don't get this or. or yeah. That, you know. It's, yeah. It's just looking at it from a reality point of view. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's really empowering. And that is what happens. <clears throat> um, we are. We're, we're gonna grow. You, whatever you want out of life, you're gonna get it. But it's that idea that it has to happen right now so that I don't have to feel bad, it doesn't work because it requires someone else to do it. That's that dependency. But as we become independent and you will you will pursue those things in a in a delayed gratification sort of way, in a methodical sort of way, in a mature way, you'll still gain whatever it is you want to gain, only you will gain it and you will be okay when you fail to gain it that's how we grow and that's what got missed that's what got missed so we can be practicing that right now and you do it with little bitty things the, the tobacco is just just one of them you know heck do it with pot don't do it with responsibilities don't don't go oh well I'm supposed to eat dinner right now but I'm gonna wait five no you can eat the, eat the dinner um, but it's usually something that you don't want to do or it's some sort of urge. You know, make yourself do those things you don't want to do and delay the instant gratification just a little bit. Whatever, you know, whatever that was. Well, anyway, okay, well, thanks for tuning in. I know we're probably going to edit by the time we get here. It's too long, so I'm just going to turn you off. <laughs>